anybody thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning? I hope you were here last week. We talked about aligning with the vine. I, I want to know before we get in, because I believe God's given me another word. I tried to align with him this week and implement this sermon. And Tuesday while I was in my office, I just closed the door for a bit and said, God, I, I need a word. I want you to speak to me, and I believe God has. But before we get into it, how many people have been trying to align their prayers with the vine this week? Anybody been trying to just align with him? Let me, let me, can I give you a quick testimony without taking advantage of your time? I'll give you just a short, short, short abridged version. If you'd like to hear the full version, come see me. But I've been praying a lot, and I've been saying, God, I've been wanting to spend time with you. I want you to, like I said last Sunday, put a difference. Let there be a, a, a change. Let people do something in my life like Moses, God, where there's a glow. And I, I want you, God, to, to, to operate and move in my life. Thursday night, I was going to see... Um, a young lady's mother in the hospital. When I was walking out, I had a man stop me and ask me for a simple direction. I gave him that direction, and we began to talk. The short version of this is, is the conversation started out with him being an atheist. saying, I do not believe in God, and I believe in Jesus. I, I'm a good person. I try to live right, but I, I don't believe in that. I began to minister and show the love of Christ, and... The end of the conversation ended up with him accepting Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Now here's the part that I love because I'll tell you about lining with the vine. And how many people know it's certainly not about Donnie Sanders. If it can work for Donnie Sanders, it can work for anybody in this building. I am, I am the bubble gum on the bottom of your shoe you brought in this morning, okay? But let me tell you what he said that just, man, it, it sent the Holy Ghost all in up and down my spine. He said, when you walked out, you separated from everybody else. I asked you a direction because there was a glow about you. There was something different about you, and I was drawn to you. That's what aligning with the vine will do by showing the love of Christ and taking the time. Somebody wanted a direction, but I gave them some better directions, and that was how to one day go to heaven. I'm telling you that God can still operate in these last days if there'll be a generation that will seek Him and spend time with Him. One more time, can we give God glory and honor and thankful? Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd ask if you will to turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. Yeah, that's what I said, Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter. And while you're turning there to the 14th verse, we I don't want to embarrass anybody. I just would like to say something small. We have somebody who's our guest here today. And if I understand correctly, their husband is deployed, uh, protecting and serving our country. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I want to tell you how privileged and honor it is to have a family of a hero in the house today. And I know there's several other people here today that your family is protecting this country. Isn't it good to be amongst heroes? Amen. We appreciate you. Ecclesiastes 7 and 14. Brother Brian says, I, doesn't know I do not know convention songs. I have a good mind to sing one to punish y'all for believing that, but I'm not going to. I can sing it. But Ecclesiastes 7, 14, if you're there, would you please give me a very good amen? All right, let's see what the word of the Lord has, because I'm really excited about this, because I believe this is a word for God, from God. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other. God has made the day of joy. But somebody take hope that God has also created the day of adversity. I want to talk to you this morning that the Lord will bless me and help me on embracing adversity. Embracing adversity. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you today. God, I feel your anointing in this house. And my prayer is that you would put an anointing on these people, that you'd open their hearts to receive the word. Lord, I pray you'd help me to get out of the way. I, I, Lord, I will be in the way. I will get in the way. But I pray that you would help me to have the strength Get out of the way and let your Holy Ghost minister in me, through me, anoint us and touch us, and we'll all give you glory and honor. And all God's children said, amen. God bless you and be seated. Thank you for the standing of the reading of the Word of God, paying it honor and respect. Adversity. Okay. I hope the cameras aren't rolling because I think I just said a bad word in church. You know, I said the word adversity. None of us like the word adversity. None of us like to deal with adversity. I don't believe any of us wake up one day and say, God, I'd like some more adversity, please. In fact, adversity has a negative connotation for 99% of us here today. 
What if I told you, though, that you shouldn't shun adversity, but rather embrace it? Would you run me out on a rail today? Would you, you, know, would you cut off my microphone and run me off as a lunatic? But before you do that today, I want to share with you three people today that faced adversity. Three people that faced adversity, and I want to share a little bit and talk a little bit about that today. The first person of these three people is Joseph. Without a doubt, Joseph dealt with adversity. At first glance, you know, we can look at adversity and we can misconstrue it as bad luck. Even though we don't believe in luck, you could call some could call it bad luck, or some of it could call it being cursed. You know, but I cannot help to think about Joseph sitting in that pit with nothing to keep him company, but the shouting of his brothers, and you know, as they rain those down on him. Joseph is stuck in this pit. He's stuck in the day of adversity. It started off like a day like any other. Joseph was running errands, looking for his brother. And when he found his brothers, he was looking for a smile. But in, he might have even been looking for an embrace. But instead, he would find a pit. Now, I'm not going to get back into a pit too much today. If you would like to go on YouTube, you can look a whole sermon on this pit ain't it. But see, oh yeah, I understand that that's not where he belonged. However, here he is, coat ruined, bruised, betrayed, and most of all, confined to a pit. Now, I cannot help but think, God, what got Joseph out of the pit and into the palace living? I can't help but wonder what transportation was used to take somebody out of the pit and put them into the palace. Genesis 37 and 28, the Lord showed me this week, I mean, we was praying, the, the, it says, then the Midianite traders passed by. And so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit. It was what caused these brothers to, to go from leaving him in the pit to all of a sudden saying, let's get him out and get him gone, is when they saw the Midianites coming. And the Midianites is what took him from the pit and transported him to Egypt where the palace was. Now, what did God use one more time to transfer Joseph from the pit to the promise? It was the Midianites. You see, there's something here, and we're going to get into some good things today. But the word Midianite is just another word for Ishmaelite, which means, look at this, contention, or strife. Midianite means contention or strife. My goodness, that's powerful. What did God use to take somebody from the pit to the promise? What did God use to take somebody from the pit to the palace? The answer is this. Strife, adversity, contention. God used adversity to take Joseph where he was to where he needed to be. And see, often what we do is we ascribe adversity to the devil. We ascribe adversity maybe to us being punished spiritually for something we shouldn't have done. Often we do this. However, maybe it never occurred to us that the devil didn't send adversity your way. Maybe God did it. Now, before you think I'm crazy, and before you get ready just to blow me off completely today, let's one more time look at our text. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made one as well as the other. God has made this day of adversity. If you're here today, friend, and you're going through a difficult day, it's not going well for you. Maybe you can't balance your budget. Maybe your family's in turmoil. Maybe you're in trouble on your job. Maybe your health is not good. Maybe your children are dealing you fits. I want to encourage you right now and understand that God is in control of the day of adversity. God is in control of that. Let me speak to some people right now that you're going through a difficult time. You're, you're, you're like Joseph. You're, you're, you're coming out of the pit. You're in the pit. You're looking out. Can you imagine with me real quick, Joseph in the pit, saying, man, this is not good, but hey, somebody might could come get me. This might be all right. And they pull him out of this pit, and they stick him as a slave in the Midianite. Here Joseph is, bound. Here is Joseph, a slave. Here is Joseph walking. He was in adversity, but what I want you to understand is that although Joseph may look out and look at the Midianites and say, man, this is a big problem, can I remind you that the Midianites were not part of the problem, they were part of the answer. God used the Midianites to get him where he needed to be. God used adversity to get him where he needed to be. Adversity wasn't part of the problem, it was part of the answer. And so often we get negative and we look at this and we have a problem and we say, God, why did you do this? And God, why did you do this? And why did you allow me to go through that? Why is there adversity? But God used adversity to get Joseph where he was to where he needed to be. And I just want to speak to somebody today that maybe you're dealing with adversity. 
Can I tell you, adversity is not here to get the best of you. Adversity is here to transport you where God's blessings are. God's adversity is not here so that you might fall on your face. God's adversity is here so you can get from the pit to the palace. God can use adversity. It's adverse the situations that caused me to walk in the blessings of God. If there was no fire in the, in the fiery furnace, and I didn't have to go through that, I wouldn't know that there would be revival in all of Babylon. If there wasn't lions in the lion's den, then I wouldn't know that there was a God who could shut the mouth. And I want to tell you, if there hadn't been for the Midianites, here you could see Joseph going through difficulty. Here you could see Joseph being depressed. Here you could see Joseph saying, my life is over. But he had no idea that when he was going through the darkest night of his life, all he was doing was being funneled right to God's awesome purpose. Can I tell you that your sickness, your problem, your devil, and your circumstance is not getting the better of you all they're doing is funneling you right to where God has for you. That's why Paul said, I'm convinced of this one thing, that all things work together for the good, for those who love the Lord. The devil can't stop me. He's only funneling me to greatness. Oh, I wish somebody give God glory and honor in this house. <laughs> See, what we do is, is we get bitter and we get hurt. And we feel like God doesn't, God owes us to go through life without adverse times. But can I tell you what happens is, is we let the pain of having to walk with the Midianites in adversity, the pain of the past, keep us from the blessings of the future. What we do is we get bitter and we stay in the pit. We never get out of the pit. We stay there bitter. We stay there mad. We stay, but can it, had it ever occurred to us that it was the Midianites that brought him from Canaan to Egypt. It was strife. It was adversity. It was difficulty. See, what happens is, is we think the pain of the past was there to destroy us. We think that because we were hurt as a young person that that's just the it. it, it, it because somebody betrayed us, because somebody defeated us, because somebody hurt us, that that's over with. But can we consider a few bullet points real quick? Can we consider this for the adversity we faced in our childhood? It's made us determined to be good parents. Because somebody let us down, now because of adversity, I made up my mind, my child's not going through that. My child's going to have a stable family life. I'm going to be at my child's ball game. I'm going to be a good person. I'm never going to lay a hand to my child in abuse. You know why? Because of what I went through now, I'm a better parent. How about that? The adversity we faced when we didn't have two nickels to rub together has now made us the manager of money we needed to be so God can do in his business, our business, what we needed to do. The adversity we faced in our first marriage has caused us to appreciate what we got in our second one. You know, it's caused us to be a, a person to be happy and content. The adversity we faced in a boss that couldn't be pleased brought out talents that we didn't even know that we had. The adversity that we faced in the season of no caused us to be able to enjoy the season of yes. Let me just stop right here and preach to somebody in a moment of adversity. Right now you're going to Egypt bound. Right now you're going to Egypt defeated. Right now you're going to Egypt as a slave. Can I tell you the day of adversity is not here to destroy you. It's here to make you, mold you, fashion you to what you can be. That one day when you're in the palace, you know what you need to do and God has equipped you to do it. See, it's okay. Give God glory and honor. Can I just be real with you for just a second? When I, I've been going through a little bit of a difficult season sometimes, okay? That's nothing on anybody. Sometimes, you know, the enemy wants to try to fight you and try to, and sometimes things don't come easy and you get in a season of adversity. When I think about that, I, I, I begin to utter things like, God, I'm just lost. God, I mean, what am I doing? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You just, Things don't go easy for you. You get in adversity, and it's a battle, and it's a fight. And you get in such difficult times that you walk around saying, God, I just, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm a problem. Maybe I'm a failure. Maybe this. God, I'm never going to taste your promise. I'm never going to get into your promised land. And I begin to think about this. Think about Joseph. Here you have Joseph. Now, I, God showed me something this week. I begin to think about it. Joseph was sold to slavery for 20 pieces of silver. And that seems like a good bid. Now, 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 back off that for just a second for me, brother. Uh, think about this for just a second. 20 pieces of silver. No, that's right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, 20 pieces of silver. That's my fault. 20 pieces of silver. 
And I begin to, I want you to understand that most people believe in, in the patriarchal days that a piece of silver was equal to a shekel in the days of Jesus. So during the patriarchal days, the days of Abraham and, and, and such that, during, during those days, that a piece of silver was equal to a shekel. Now, why is that interesting? Because in 2003, I, there was an article that came out that I read that a shekel was worth 64 cents. So I want you to do the math here. 20 times 64 cents brings Joseph's value to $12.80. They sold. Understand, this was to shame him. He got sold for less than the cost of a lunch in Cracker Barrel. That's his value. And that's what adverse times will do. It will cause you to doubt your value. Somebody help me this morning. The devil wants you to believe that you're no good. The devil wants you to believe that it can't happen. The devil wants to fight you. And what happens is, is we walk around thinking that our value is less than $13. Has the devil ever done something to somebody, made you so low, made you so down, fought you so hard that you were either a bad businessman, a bad pastor, a bad preacher, a bad teacher, a bad singer, a bad husband, a bad wife, a bad child, but you went through such difficulty that you're walking around believing your value is $12.80. There's somebody in this building that's got a dollar mentality that you're a $13 value. You understand that that's something Joseph carried. His own family said, you're not worth $13. The price of a female slave, according to the Levitical law, was 30 pieces of silver. So we know it was done in shame. $12.80. Anybody ever walked around with this kind of mentality? You just felt defeated. Maybe you start questioning, God, am I only worth $13? Is my life only worth $13? Is my marriage only worth $13? Is my ability only worth $13? And we question it. What I love about this is, is that Joseph fought through adversity with somebody labeling him $13, with him maybe walking around believing it. He pressed through. Did you know in Genesis that Pharaoh renames Joseph? He renames him Zephinoth Penei. Zephinoth Penei. That's what he renames him. I love that. Here you got Joseph, the $13 man, the dollar mentality person. And Pharaoh says, Joseph, you've done a great thing. I'm not calling you Joseph anymore. I'm calling you Zephinoth Penei, which means treasury of glorious rest. Don't you love that? You've got a bunch of people telling me you ain't worth $13, but then you got the king telling him you're a treasure. I just want to speak to somebody right now that's walking around with a $13 mentality. Maybe you think you're only worth $13. Maybe your neighbor only thinks you're worth $13. Why don't we stop listening to ourselves? Why don't we stop listening to our neighbor and hear what the king has to say? We might say we're no good, but Jesus says we're invaluable. We might say that we can't do it, but God says I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. We may believe that we're down. We may label ourselves no good, but can I tell you Jesus still calls us the apple of his eye. I'm sick of living with a dollar mentality when Jesus says you are a treasure. You're such a treasure that I came off of heaven, got on a cross that I might die and redeem you that you might be where I am. I refuse to walk around with a dollar mentality when there's a king telling me you're a treasure. If you're bankrupt today, you're a treasure. If you're divorced 10 times, you're a treasure. If your kids won't have anything to do with you, you're still a treasure with Jesus Christ. Stop living with the dollar mentality and say, God, I want to hear from you. Tell me who I really am. You see, not only that, what gets me from a dollar mentality to a treasure mentality? The Midianites. Adversity, difficulty. I just want to stop right here because this might not be for everybody, and that's fine. But I know there's some people here today with a $13 attitude. You've let your circumstances talk to you for so long that there's nobody there for you to get married, that God doesn't hear your prayers, that God's not going to bless you with a child, that there's not a job out there for you, that you're never going to get out of the red and into the black. Can I tell you, we got to stop listening to ourselves 
we got to stop listening to those around us that want to hinder the promise anyway. And we got to start saying, God, tell me what, who I really am. See, here's something awesome. Can I stop right here and be honest with you for just a second? Because I want you to pray for me real quick. I don't know what happened, but I, I know that this is a word from God for somebody today. But I just got like a pain in my back, and I, I, I don't even know why. It's just causing me to breathe a little hard right now. Can you just stretch your hands and pray for me? I don't know. I, I, I hate the devil. I, I Really, I do. But will you please pray for me? God, I just pray right now, Lord Jesus, that you hinder every distraction. Lord, I don't know, Lord God, what's going on in my back, but I pray right now in Jesus' name that you heal it, that you give me my breath. God, that you would give me uh, some comfort, that my mind's not wandering because of the sharp pain. I believe it in Jesus' name, and the devil's a liar, and he's defeated. And I want everybody who believes that to shout amen in this house. Amen. All right, here we go. Oh, oh, my goodness, I do feel better. I promise you I do. I'm not trying to be funny, but I promise you I feel better. But I, I, I want to tell you this. This is what I love about this. I want you to understand what's important about Joseph. Joseph represents something very important. He represents the life of the promise. Not only is he the promise, he represents the life of the promise. Do you get that? If it hadn't been for Joseph, the promise would have died in Canaan of famine. He represents not only part of the promise because he's part of Abraham's seed, he represents the life. Okay, now, I want you to hold up on this slide for just a second. I, I want to show you this. That's who he represents. He represents the life of the promise. But let me ask you a question. Who gets him out of the pit and transports him from Canaan to Egypt? The Midianites. And the Midianites is just another word for Ishmaelites. Ishmaelites were the descendants of Ishmael. You know who Ishmael is? Ishmael's the son that Abraham had on his own. God said, I'm going to give you a child. So Abraham took that as to saying, okay, well, I'll go make my own with my servant instead of believing your word. So I want you to understand something. If Joseph represented, help me, Jesus, the life of the promise, then Ishmael represented Abraham's biggest blunder. You follow me on that one? You put that one on the screen. It should be on there. If we, represent, if we represent that Joseph was the life of the promise, Ishmael represented his biggest problem. Isn't that awesome? That God used it, his biggest blunder to still further the promise. There's some people in this building, maybe you messed up on your own. Maybe you're the one, that the reason why your marriage didn't work. Maybe you're the one that hurt your children. Maybe you got fired for a good reason. Isn't it good to know that the pain of my past cannot stop the blessing of my future? That God can still use the difficulty of my past. Oh, I just feel like preaching for just a second because there's some people in this building, you're not a crystal cathedral person. You might have scars on your body that you're not proud of. You might have a bad past where you used to party. You used to drink. You did bad things. You were a drug addict. Can I just stop right here and tell you that your Ishmael can't stop your Joseph, that God will use it to move you, to push you, and to help you? Oh, let me take it a step further. In Genesis, an angel comes and tells Ishmael is going to be someone who resists and who fights. That's what your Ishmaels will do. It'll resist against the things of God. It'll fight against them. But I want you to know, isn't it good to know that God can take my Ishmaels and turn a Joseph out of them? I, it might not be for some of you that has been perfect your whole life. But are there any sinners in the building that's got some Ishmaels in their life that you said some things you weren't proud of, you did some things you weren't happy with, you went some places? I'm glad that the gospel is not about perfect people. It's about bruised, hurt, defeated people that God can change and turn them around. If you've got some Ishmaels, don't let them fight against you. Let God use them to bring forth life. I'm thankful. I'm so thankful that God still takes Ishmael's and produces Joseph's. One more time, give God glory and honor. <laughs> Embrace that adversity. Embrace it. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. <coughs> See, I got a cough. We're not perfect people. If you're looking for a perfect pastor, you might as well get rid of me right now because I'm not perfect. I haven't been perfect. I've done things I'm not proud of. I've said things I'm not proud of. I'm not a perfect person. But God will use adversity to help us. And I want to show you three ways that God will use adversity to help us. Number one, and I believe these are things that God gave me. I really believe the revelation words for some people here today. God will use adversity to line our prayer. 
See, when I begin to think about this, and when I think of adversity, I cannot help but think of Hannah. I cannot think of Hannah, but help but think of Hannah. And i got to be honest with you, I'm connected to Hannah. This is our second person we're going to talk about today. I cannot help but think of Hannah. Let me give you a little backstory on Hannah. Hannah couldn't have children. If you don't know the pain of being barren, it's a really real pain. Things that people do naturally, they take for granted, like eating or sleeping, it just comes natural to humans for it to be difficult. There's nothing like the pain of being barren. I can tell you I know firsthand. It's, it's frustrating. It's hard. But here you got Hannah, Elk and I, her um, husband. He had two wives. He had Penina, 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 and he had Hannah. He loved Hannah. Hannah couldn't have any children. Panana was a big mouth. Is it wrong to dislike people in the Bible? Can I just, just let you know I can't stand Panana? I don't even know what she looks like. I just don't like her. I, I, I got a picture of her in my head. I don't like her. And all she would do is make fun of Hannah when Elk and I wasn't looking, letting her know, hey, I'm about to have children. He's going to give me some gifts and bless me and you don't have any children. You're worthless. You're worthless. Isn't that terrible? Isn't that terrible? To walk around and have a Penina running her big mouth. And I think there's probably the saddest verse. One of the saddest verses is verse 7 of First Samuel 1. Look at this. Year after year. We're going to talk on a couple things right here. But look at this. Year after year, it was the same. Penina would taunt Hannah as they went into the tabernacle. Each time, look at this, Hannah would be reduced to tears. She wouldn't even eat. God, I wish I had time here because Elk and I gave her a double portion to eat. The bridegroom gave her a double portion, but the, her enemy had convinced her. God, so difficult, she wouldn't even partake in the goodness that the bridegroom had given her. I wish I had some time to delve, delve in that. I don't. <coughs> Excuse me. But we see here, that's not the, the sad part. Look at the sad part. Year after year. That means it wasn't one year. That means it wasn't two years. That means it wasn't three years. Oh, hear me. Year after year after year, she had to deal with this adversity. Year after year, she'd have to deal with this pain. Year after year, she had to deal with this big mouth and accumulated on the Christmas of grief every year when they went to the temple. And Elkanah would give all of Penina's children blessings, and she didn't have one. Year after year of pain, year after year of being barren. And some of you know what I'm talking about, not just with children, but with your prayers, with your belief. You feel barren. Year after year of crying to being reduced to tears, where she couldn't even eat. Now my question is this, why? Was it the devil fighting just a good woman, right? The devil, don't we just hate the devil fighting a good woman? Hannah who prayed, Hannah who believed, Hannah who wept, Hannah who cried, the demons, the devils. Don't we hate the devils for doing that to her? Only one problem. It wasn't the devil. Look at verse 5. But Hannah, Elkanah, would give a double portion. For he loved Hannah. Look at this. Although the Lord had closed her womb. Oh, my God. Let me just stop right here. I feel, I, I got to say this. I just feel the Holy Ghost come on me. I just say this. Some of you have been barren. You walk around thinking you're no good. But God is closing you for a season. God's closing you. It's God that's doing it. And i got to be honest with you, I love Hannah, and, and this got me Tuesday, and I said, God, why? Why would you reduce this woman to year after year, let's call it eight years, of crying and weeping at the altar and big mouth Panana getting to have her say, the enemy taunting, saying, you're no good. Oh, God, help me. That you're not going to get it. 
And we got to listen to the taunts of the enemy. And I said, God, this isn't in your character. I don't understand it. And I'm telling you, talking about aligning with the vine, I said, God, I know there's something here, and I'm not leaving until you show me. And then I went to 1 Samuel, the second chapter, and God, just almost like a highlighter, made this jump off. Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels. Eli was the high priest. So all the priests of Israel were scoundrels, except for Eli, who was about to die and had no respect for the Lord. Now you might say, Brother Donnie, what does that have to do with anything? Oh, God, help me, Jesus. Because I want to show you something. Do you remember the prayer that brought a miracle? Do you remember a prayer that turned it around? And God blessed her with a child that she called Samuel. Let's look at this prayer. And she made this vow. O oh Lord of heaven's armies, if you'll look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you and he will be yours for his entire lifetime. She goes on to call him, he said, I'll call him Samuel and I'll make him a Nazarite. He won't cut his hair and he'll be a priest to you. And God spoke to my heart and he said this, he said, it was difficult for Hannah, but the difficulty wasn't there to hurt her. It was to mold her so she would pray the right prayer. The moment she prayed the prayer that God wanted her to pray, he needed a high priest. The moment he said, God, I will give you this child, and I want you to use him, there was a miracle. See, you're not barren because you're bad. You're not barren because you're no good. God is trying to get us to the point where we say, God, take over my business. God, get in my marriage. God, get in my children. There's going to come a point where God's going to bless you with a Samuel. But hear this young preacher. If you polled Hannah, she would tell you every year, every tear, every pain-filled moment was worth it. Samuel doesn't have one book named after him. He's got two. Oh, hear me right now. Hear me with somebody in this building that's having to live with a panina. Can I just get in the flesh for just a second? Is it okay if I get in the flesh for just a second? Our young people don't know what the word what in the flesh means, do you? Amen. Can I just get in the flesh for something? I gotta ask a question. Where's Panana now? Where is she now? Can I just get in the flesh? I don't hear another thing out of that big mouth, and I don't hear another thing out of her children. She's just a footnote. She's gone. But the one that endured, the one that was barren, the one that fought, the one that prayed, the one that wept, the one that believed, the one that didn't lose her integrity, the one that didn't lose her character, the one that didn't get mad, the one that didn't get bitter, the one that didn't give up, the one that didn't shout against God. Now her child, not only anointed king, he killed him. He wrote a book and he put his hands on the granddaddy of the Messiah. It's worth the tears. It's worth the pain. It's worth the difficulty. It might be barren now, but there's a blessing on the way. It's worth it, church. It's worth it to believe. It's worth it to cry. It's worth it. Now, somebody say, where's Panana now? I don't hear her big mouth anymore. I don't hear her shouting anymore. There's going to come a time where you won't hear Panana anymore. The Panana says, why has God made you sick? The Panana that says, why is your children doing this? The Panana that says, if God's going to bless you, why are you struggling you on your job? I can't help but ask, how do you like me now, Panana? One more time, give God glory and honor in this house. See, not only will God use that to align our prayer, and if you're here today before we move on, real quickly, check your prayer. Help me, God, to pray the right prayer. But number two, and I love this one, God will help me to amend my character. The three A's, he'll align my prayer. Number two, he will amend our character. See, I'm going to drop something on you that you're probably not going to believe me at first. But can I just tell you real quickly? Saul and David had an awful lot in common. I know you think I'm crazy, but let's look at it real quickly. That's what they had in common. 
Both came from very humble beginnings. Both were very small in their own eyes. You need to hear this today. Poor Saul. Both experienced a mighty victory against the Philistines early on that projected them to popularity. Both of them, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. Both were sung about about the people of Israel. Now here's the one you really need to understand. This gets me for poor Saul, tragic figure. Both prophesied under the power of God. They have a lot in common, right? Now here's the beautiful part about this. Although they have a lot in common, their fates will be tragically changed. This is what the Lord showed me. and Sometimes God just speaks to me and I just share it to y'all. And this might be just for me this morning. Let me show you about what happened with Saul. Saul was anointed king in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10. He was anointed king in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Somebody say chapter 10. Okay. Do you know when he became king? 1 Samuel chapter 10. Okay, so let, let's look real quickly. I got some things that happens in between Saul being anointed king and actually becoming king. Saul gets free bread. Amen. That's pretty awesome. Saul prophesies with the prophets, and Saul hides amongst the luggage. That's it. From the moment he was anointed king by Samuel to the moment he was proclaimed king, those three things happened in one chapter. We're talking about days. Okay, so we see that. Now let's talk about, and hold on before you put up on David. I want to talk to you about a second. Let's look at David. David was anointed king in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Somebody say chapter 16. Do you know when he was proclaimed king of Israel? Chapter 16 is a good guess. That's what I thought. You'd be wrong. It's a good guess. It's what I guessed. That's why I know it's a good guess. <laughs> How about 2 Samuel Whole nother book, chapter 5. From the moment they poured oil on his head, to the moment they put a crown on his head of all of Israel, 1 Samuel 16 to 2 Samuel chapter 5. Can I show you the list of things that David had to endure before the moment he was made king? Let's, let's look at this. David faced a giant. David served as the king, uh, served the king as servant, served Saul as his servant. David had to kill 200 Philistines to marry his promised bride. Not bad, is it? Whoops, we got more. Saul tries to kill David. Saul tries to kill David again. Saul once again, well, you get the picture. David has to flee out of a window of his house and becomes a fugitive. David is estranged from his bride. One more, and then we're good, right? David has to pretend to be insane to escape out of the clutches of King Achish. Now, that's a big difference, right? Only one problem, we're not done. David begins to live in caves. David goes through such severe depression that he actually draws, the Bible says, other people that are depressed. David has to deal with the guilt of a whole city of priests and their families for dying, a whole city for helping him. David was betrayed by the men of Ziph to Saul. Keep on going. Saul decides to stop pursuing David only to change his mind, but then he starts pursuing David again. Saul decides to stop pursuing David only to change his mind once again. So that's twice David thinks he's in the clear, and then he has to go back on the run. David is forced to go live with his enemies, the Philistines. David is rejected by the Philistines. David's home city of Ziglag is burned to the ground. Let's keep going. David and his men's families are stolen with everything along that he owns. David's closest friends, his closest friends then start talking about stoning him. David fights a battle to get his family and his possessions back. David loses his best friend, Jonathan. David was rejected by all of Israel except Judah. And David faces a civil war that lasted, what I'm calculating, seven years in order to get the full kingdom that was his. Big difference. At the latest that David was a, a, anointed by Samuel, he would have been 17 years old. He becomes king at 37. So at the minimum, 20 years. 20 years versus Saul, 20 years of adversity, 20 years of fighting, 20 years of being homeless, 20 years of being a fugitive, 20 years of fighting a big battle. Saul had three things. We had four slides. Now, here's what I found, though. 
Saul would die on the field, the battlefield, a rejected king, a defeated king, away from God, and a disgraced human being. David would be the greatest earthly king to ever walk this earth and the grandfather of the Messiah. That lets me know there's a correlation. Now look at this. There's a correlation that shows us the greater the adversity on the way to the throne, the greater the kingship. See, Saul, it came easy. Saul, it was easy. He didn't have to work for it. He didn't have to face difficult times. It just came naturally to him. God blessed him, and he crumbled. But with David, God made up his mind he was going to build David. He was going to work with him. He was going to help him. He was going to mold him. And 20 years of difficulty, 20 years of hardship, 20 years of fighting. You know what I found out? God's a chef, and sometimes he just likes to marinate. Anybody like steaks? I like to marinate my thing for my steak for like about 12 hours. I like it good and soaked and good and juices. Chicken, we sometimes do over 24 hours. You dip that bad boy in it and throw it on there, it ain't going to taste very good. Sometimes God has to marinate us. What are you trying to tell me before we get ready to go on? Can I tell you, it's not coming easy for you. It's not coming easy for you. But I want you to remember this. The greater the struggle on the way to the throne, the greater the kingship. And before I move on to my last point, can I just remind you something here? David's mighty men. If you haven't studied David's Mighty Men, will you please look? I believe it's in First and Second Kings. You need to read this. There's a movie waiting to happen in these guys. We're talking about guys that three of them could defeat a whole army to go get him a glass of water. Bad guys. That's awesome. David's wife, David's infrastructure, and David's priest, Ahimelech. All of those people, do you know when he picked up? It wasn't after he was king. He picked them up in the 20 years of adversity. God's building you right now, friend. Do you know what adversity means? It's a sign saying under construction. If it doesn't come easy, this is what preached to me, if it doesn't come easy to you, it doesn't mean that God's not working. So I'm praying, God, whatever you've got to mold into me, mold in. And whatever you've got to mold out, mold out. Work in me. It's not coming easy. And before we move on to our last point and close, let me ask you a question. Which list does your life look like today? Are you wanting God give me the Saul list? I like to check off those three things, free bread, I mean, you can't go wrong with that. Prophesy, I don't want to be about the shout, but I don't want no difficulty. Are you on David's list? Are you on David's list? Before we close, if you'll give me four minutes, I want to share the third final A with you, the third thing about, and that's God will adjust our attitude. And it's literally three or four minutes. We're back to Joseph, our third person. I want to close with him. I want you to think about this. God used the Midianites, you follow me, to get Joseph from Cana to Egypt because he had to be in Egypt so that he could get under Pharaoh and he could tell interpret his dream and he could save the world but you know what occurred to me this is what occurred to me Canaanites done their job because they done their job he was in Egypt he he could have started day one he could have said they could have been that day Pharaoh could have had a bad dream right and he could say hey we know this guy he's working for Potiphar he's awesome He's helped Potiphar. Potiphar's already one of the generals. He's one of the military men that's connected to Pharaoh. Everything's already ready. I want you to hear me. I'm about to say something good for you. It really helped me. Everything's aligned for Joseph to already meet Pharaoh. You see, this is what occurred to me. The Midianites were for Joseph. But the, I'm sorry, the Midianites were for the world, to save the world, to get him where he needed to be. But prison was for Joseph. I know you think I'm crazy, but let me explain this why I think this. Because if your brothers just sold you out and told you you ain't worth but a lunch at Cracker Barrel, if the people, if your brothers came right back up from you day one, it would have been sweet, wouldn't it? Oh, look how the tables have turned, my brothers. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw you in prison. I'm going to sell you to slavery. How about this? Hey, guys, kill them. If he would have done that, follow me, he would have killed the promise. More specifically, he would have killed Judah. Who comes out of Judah? Somebody shout his name. Oh, I said shout it. We don't whisper the name of Jesus. We shout it. Who comes out of Judah? Jesus. Matter of fact, go on and stand with me so you know I'm done. But, but, but hear me, hear me. I'm not done. 
but just so you know that I won't make you stand long. Listen. If he would have killed Judah, the prophecy would have been dead. Prison, adversity, was not for the world. He was already in position. Prison was to adjust Joseph's attitude. Do you know what happens when he meets his brothers? He blesses them with grain, gives them their money back. He gets so upset at the end that he has to go and weep because he loves his brothers and misses them so much. He's trying to, I, I could tell, you know why he's doing that? Because there's a part of him that says, make them pay. But then there's this attitude that's been adjusted by God that says, those are your brothers, man. Love them. Bless them. Do you not see what I've done, Joseph? Do you not see that I used them? Do you not see what I've done? Hear me before we close. Prison is for you. Now don't misconstrue that because that could get us in trouble. Your adversity is adjusting your attitude. Because your attitude, if you go easy, is I built this business. I built this kingdom. I'm a financial wizard. I'm awesome. I'm charismatic. I'm powerful. But prison is there to adjust our attitude. Anybody would say, I've been blessed, but I'm only blessed because God gave it. That's the attitude that's been adjusted. It comes because it didn't come easy. It comes because you went through difficulty. Now, I know that this sermon's not for everybody, and I'm not going to be offended by it, but I, want, I would like every head bowed.